She only stepped out to go for a job interview, but didn't make it back alive. You know, Bongo Morin's corpse was found in a shallow grave at the very place where she had gone to seek a job. She sent this tweet six days ago saying she needed a job with a text, I am creative, really good in thinking critically, and most importantly, a fast learner, CV available on request. Someone replied to that tweet, inviting her for an interview. That person is the man now suspected of raping her, killing her, and uh, uh, burying her in a shallow grave. Women's rights advocate Mary Ikoku joins us now via Zoom. Good morning, Mary Ikoku. Good morning. Oh, this, this issue really has become, you know, one too many. We've seen stories like this time and time again in our communities and, you know, amplified especially on social media platforms like Twitter. Um, quickly, how do we make our society safe, you know, for women? Because when we listen to analysis of this issue, it seems the blame time and time again goes to the victim. People say, why did the victim go out at this time of the night? Why is she dressed in this certain way? So really, how can we make our society safer and begin to change the mindsets of people, you know, away from blaming the victim in situations like this? First of all, I think that uh, what has happened to the young woman is really sad and unfortunate. Um, how do we make our society safe? I think this whole issue of safety comes from a very long place. I think the most important thing is that we need to address a lot of these historical imbalances that we've come to know as a people, where you begin to think that you're more powerful and you're stronger than the other gender, and at, at the same time, you are superior and you can actually take, maim a life that you did not create. That is where the safety question should really start from. And beyond that, I think we also uh, need to also argue about what safety. This is a country where even the man is not safe. There's hardly anybody that is safe. It looks as if we're even on, everybody's on a queue, waiting for the day it will be your turn. So whether it's in the church, it's in, it's in your home. I mean, these people, hoodlums, bandits, anybody, you can be maimed, you can be killed, you can be abducted at any point in time. But back to the issue at hand, we're talking about in Nyabong, a young woman whose only crime is that she wanted to find a job and make a living and not till the other way around where young girls that you see, some of them may just feel, oh, let me go the lazy way out. This young woman was looking for a job. And the least society can do is to give her that job and not to take her life. We need to create safe spaces for women and girls. But most importantly, we need to create a country, a society that is safe for all, male, female. Everybody needs to feel safe in this country, in this society. Now, coming to our girls, women and girls, when we are building infrastructure, there's several levels of safety. You need to ensure that even your critical infrastructure spaces, the buildings, the stores, the, back, the bus parks and uh, bus stops and all that are well littered up and they have com uh, concrete access spaces points where people who you may assume are the um how like a vulnerable group can have clear access places littered up that people in danger can be found and seen that somebody's life is in danger i don't really have an idea where this event took place but i can only imagine that it may be once some desolate place but the safety we should be looking around about, are talking about is also how community, how community can watch out for one another in the space where this crime, heinous crime, was committed. Was still nobody who heard her. She didn't scream, apart from the friend who started screaming from Lagos that her friend's life is in danger. Creating space, uh, safe spaces also involves the mechanisms of our law uh, enforcement agencies. There, is a, there are cases of emergency. There are shouts of somebody's life is in danger and you are waiting for 24 hours before you will get to work. These are some of the safety issues that we need to you know, critically look into. Whether it is in the social safety, whether it is in the in critical infrastructure area, when we are building, when we are designing spaces, that we need to make it safe for all concerned, all citizens of the country, you all see. Right. So, I mean, for me, safety 
pro, uh, of our environment cuts across both infrastructure safety, um, space management, and social safety where communities are looking out for each other and be able to scream when you see that somebody's life is in danger. All right. Well, where, where also do you think we need to fix with regards to our criminal justice system? Um, I believe that, you know, for a long time, there's, you know, not been enough examples made of some of these perpetrators. Um, and that has, you know, made it maybe, a, you know, a little easier for some of these crimes to continue to exist in our society. And so in the criminal justice aspect, you know, what do you think must be fixed? Um, what laws do you think must change? Um, yeah, we have, uh, of course, the Violence Against um, uh, People's um, uh, Prohibition Act. There's some of, some of all of those things in existence, but, you know, I don't know how effective they have been since their, you know, their existence. So in the criminal justice direction, what do you think must change and must be fixed? <laughs> Good. Um, I, I, I want to say that in the criminal justice, criminal justice sector, I think that the VAP Act, Violence Against uh, Persons Prohibition Act is one fantastic uh, law in Nigeria that every state really need to domesticate. I was part of a team that um, um, did a national research on the on the successes and challenges of the VAP Act, the implementation of this act and their successes. And it's interesting that some of the states that this, this act has been domesticated, that they are seeing increasing um, successes. It's, we're not yet there. But you can see that because people know and understand that this law is in place, it begins to serve as a deterrent somehow that you know that when you rape a woman, this you will face the law. There's 14 years jail term for you and all of some other uh, punishment. Even though some of us think that the, the punishment um, accrued, accruing to people of some of this gender-based violence are not uh, if, uh, if, uh, enough, you know. But our justice system is a place we really also need to look at critically in terms of creating that safe space for women and girls. Um, just like uh, I want to touch on the issue of timeline. You see, like the police have this timeline, you want to wait 48 hours or 24 hours before you can step in and do your job even when a life is at stake. Even in our criminal justice system, you see somebody who has an issue of uh, gender-based violence or criminal case and uh, uh, abduction or rape and any of those things. You are seeing them, the victims, appearing in court, prosecution lingers on for so many years. This is one area that I think that we need to look at. Timeline. It will linger for so many years that after some time they tell you it has become statue back. Crazy, isn't it? But we need to say, just like this justice system have made provision for elections, when there is an election, you have a certain period of timeline where every case concerning election of that year must end. We should bring that to the justice, uh, to the court, when in terms of dealing with issues, issues of gender-based uh, violence and getting justice for victims of crimes such as rape, such as molestations, okay. abuse, domestic violence, and all of that. And any crime, really. All so right, Mary Koku. That, that. Yes. Yeah. You see, we, we, could, we could go on about this issue, but there's an underlying issue to this you know, issue with um, INE. We know from what the police say that they uncovered a shallow grave with other bodies there. And the reports have been seen, these are unverified, but what, what we've seen on social media is that, you know, this particular guy who kidnapped, raped, and murdered Ini, you know, did is in the business of doing this. He basically reaches out to young girls in collaboration with his sister, his family. Like his family is, you know, in the business. What they do is that they, you know, lure innocent victims and they kill them and harvest their organs. Organs. So what, what do you have to well, say about this you know, well, organ, you know, perceived organ harvesting? You know, we, we've seen this news, you know, time and time again in Nigeria, but it seems like this is confirmed right now in Aquaibom. Well, um, just quickly mentioned, you know, that it's still been investigated. Yes. And so some of these are still just social media speculations. They are not verified um, yet. But the police um, did to, say that they um, found her body and, you know, she was mutilated, you know. Well, and go ahead, uh, Mary. Yeah, from seeking for a job, there's a job offer being raped, being violated and then killed, buried in a shallow grave. Look at the, look, just look at the whole process. And, and, and series of events.
that went on. So it takes a community, it takes a, it takes a whole family. Hmm. And that report, it may be an allegation, but there is some reasonable level of truth if you look critically at it. How can all of these events have happened and nobody would say, call in the police and say, this is what is going on? And you can see the process through which even the culprit was found. It takes the effort of the community. Hmm. And then I think that this country, this society, need to pay more attention to how we deal with cases of this nature. You have seen serial killers, serial rapists, serial pedophiles, go scotch free in our court of law, in our courtrooms. And it shouldn't be like that because when you let go one criminal, you also put the, the, the life of another citizen at risk because he's going to come back and maim, rape, kill another person. Mm. So we need to begin to see how we can flag all of these criminals and make sure that even in the neighborhood where they live, for the ones who did not get, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, capital punishment, if they have to still exist in our society, we owe everybody in that community a duty to flag the home where that person lives and say, a pedophile lives in this space. Yeah. Why you need to do that is because people who live in that environment need to know that their movement, when to go out and all of that, that there is a questionable character in your neighborhood. Okay. You're not doing it because you want to name and shame alone. You also want to protect the life of other people. And right. I think that... Very government cool. needs to really go deep, deep into this matter and br bring everybody to, to book. Father, sister, brother, everybody involved. Even the neighbors that would have noticed something finicky going on and said nothing. All right. Everybody Thank you very much. Up, up hmm. Thank you very much. Um, it feels good having this conversation and we hope that we can have more and more um, to find a way to make our society safer for women, girls and for everybody in general. Thanks, uh, Mary Koku, Thanks. for joining Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks right. for having me. And this is where we wrap up uh, the breakfast this morning. Thank you so much for starting our Monday with us. If you missed out on any of this, remember, uh, get on our social media platforms at Plus TV Africa on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel, also Plus TV Africa. Look out for the new page, Plus TV Lifestyle. Um, it's a goodbye from me. Yes, and goodbye from me. Have a beautiful day.